Well, good morning. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. We are so blessed to have you here to worship with us this morning. Whether you are in person here in the sanctuary or you are viewing via live stream, we are just so thankful that you would choose to worship with us this morning. And we pray that the word of God will touch your very heart and soul and change you and change you because that's what we all seek. We seek to grow closer to God. We seek to be more Christ-like. And I pray that something that you hear here this morning will have you on that journey to becoming more like Christ. A couple of announcements we have this morning. Um, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Mary Elliott's birthday. And Mary Elliott's birthday, we should all celebrate. She is such a treasure to Providence United Methodist Church and the community, and we just praise God for celebrating her birthday today. And also, if you did not notice coming in this morning, which I don't think how you could not notice it, but the beautiful, beautiful garden that has been put together by loving hands and Billy Dale, we want to thank you so much. And you know, my, my buddy Ralph, who I love so much, He's looking down, and you and I kind of joked about it this morning, but he's looking down saying, that is beautiful, and it's about time. <laughs> and um, my brother Gary, I think, had a lot to do with that, and I want to thank Gary as well. Um, really appreciate that effort. So now, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Jesus Calling, but it's one of my favorite devotionals because when you read it daily, it's written in a way that Jesus is speaking to you. And to me, it just makes it so intimate and so personal, and I love that devotional. And I just want to share with you this morning in reading through uh, Jesus' calling, this one came just, I felt that I had to share it with you this morning. And it reads like this. When you are going through a dark time, a hard time, it is easy to think that it will last forever. The longer you struggle, the darker it seems. You begin to imagine that good things will never happen again. Anybody felt like that in this past year, year and a half? You may even feel like giving up. That's why it is so very important to remember that I am always with you. And because I am in complete control, I can turn your darkness into light. And then 2 Samuel twenty two twenty nine 29 tells us this. It says, Lord, you give my light to my lamp. The Lord brightens the darkness around me. Now, I don't know and I don't remember where I heard this, but it's in the back of my head, and I've just got to ask this one question. Something that is so beautiful as this, something that is so important like this, church, why would we not share this? Why would we not share this? So like I said, there's something in the back of my head. I hear this voice telling me, do you know somebody? Do you know somebody that needs to hear those words? And now please stand for our call to worship.
Jesus prayed for his disciples, giving them into God's eternal care. Jesus prays for us, giving us into God's care. Know that you have been blessed with the love of the Savior. We live in that love and seek to serve God. Open your hearts and spirits now to hear God's word. May our lives be open to God's spirit and reflect God's love. Amen. You may be seated. And now let us pray. God of incredible surprises, as we gaze into the clouds, remind us that we are standing on holy ground. Place our feet on the pathways of peace and hope. Draw our attention from the vision of the Lord rising to the heavens to be with you and help us to focus on the ministries that you would have us do. Keep us ready and willing always to serve you all of our days. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you here on this beautiful day. And we're going to be reflecting a lot on the goodness of God and the greatness of God this morning in two of our songs. And I was thinking about that psalm that says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And to magnify, if you think about a magnifying glass, right, you're purposefully expanding and bringing to light something, taking it from really small and making it bigger. And I was thinking it's so easy for us to focus on the things in our lives that aren't going well, the things that we want to fix, maybe the difficult people or the difficult circumstances, and those get bigger and bigger. And that's kind of a daily struggle, I think, for most of us. But I think the challenge is let's magnify the Lord today. Let's magnify his goodness, his greatness, and what he can do in our lives. So please worship with me as we sing, How Great Is Our God and How Great Thou Art. Please stand. Oh. Uh -huh. 
morning. Have you ever received a letter in the mail? It's kind of exciting sometimes. Might be from grandma, might be a response from the letter you wrote to Santa. You know, might be something good in there. Might not be, but you know. When, it, when you're young, usually it's pretty cool to get a letter. So this morning we're going to talk about a letter that Paul wrote from the Apostle Paul to the people of Ephesus. Now, Paul was in jail in Rome, and he heard about the Ephesians. He heard that um, they had faith in Jesus and love for other people. So he wrote to them, telling them to keep the hope. He had lived with them for about three years and was teaching them and working with them, eating with them, sleeping with them. He spent all his time with them. So he wanted to let them know that he was thinking of them and that he was praying for them, praying for them continuously. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this morning, when you hear the um, second reading, and you'll hear uh, Ephesians in 118 says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. But our hearts really don't have eyes. What he was saying to us is to look at other people with our heart, to love them and to care about them and to give each other hope. He was also giving them knowledge of God. He wanted them to know more about God because every day we should know God better. It strengthens our relationship with God. And John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he's speaking of what Jesus is going to do um, because he wants us to understand the sacrifice that he gave for us. Um, when, think about going on a car trip with your family, okay? Usually dad's driving and mom is sitting next to him or perhaps an older sibling, and you're excited for the day when it's finally your turn to be the one to sit in the front seat. Well, when God sacrificed Jesus on the cross and then rose him from the dead, he brought him to heaven to be in the front seat on that right side. So basically, he made Jesus the head and the church, the body. So what he wants us to do is to love and pray for one another. So I have this little prayer guide here. At the top um, is today's second reading. And then here it says, things I will pray for other Christians. So he did want us to pray for other believers but here it says, I will pray these things for the following people. Because there are people out there that still need to know the love and the hope that Jesus brings us. As you mature and grow, maybe you'll have one of these. This is my prayer book. Um, I keep it with me when I pray at my devotions and I make notes in there and I can go back and look for people I want to pray for and things I want to pray for and things that I want to remember because the older you get, the less you remember. So, but anyway, um, my um, challenge to you for this week is to write a letter for someone that needs hope because that's really what it's all about for all of us, is giving one another hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for opening the eyes of our hearts to see others as you do. Help us to pray for each other and give each other hope so we can all be together with you. Amen.
The first scripture reading this morning comes to us from Psalm 47, God's rule over the nations. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a song. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning's reading from Ephesians is talking to the uh, people in Ephesus, and this is from Paul. Paul loved those people, and he loves uh, loves us in his word also. So we can apply what Paul said to them to us. This is from Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Paul's prayer. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious God, what a a great opportunity that you give me to share your word with your people. A sinner saved by your grace. Father, I am truly grateful for the gift of salvation. But I know that I'm still a broken vessel But all you have to do is say the word, and I shall be healed long enough to do your work and to do your will. Hide this preacher behind the cross that your people might see you and not me, that they might hear you and not me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 
When I was at St. Peter's College in undergraduate studies, there were only two theology majors, me and another guy, in the whole school. Only two of us. And I don't know, but it seems as though periodically I would get cornered to answer people's theological questions. Not that I had the answer, but I would get cornered. Things that folks had struggled with, some that were actually losing the faith, losing hope. They would ask me things like, why are science and faith that war with one another? Is hell really an eternal torment for millions of people? Why, are, why is the God of the Old Testament so violent? Have you, any of you have ever received some of these kinds of questions? Why does scripture contradict itself? And what do we do with all of the other religions? Surely they can't all be wrong, they would say. And why does God allow so much suffering in the world without intervening or interceding. So the, for the sake of time, I'll deal with the last question. Why does God allow so much suffering in the world without interceding? I want you to know I don't have all the answers, but here's how I answered it. From my observation, it's not that we're asking the question whether God intercedes. Because the Bible is full of stories of God interceding. Would you say amen? The Exodus story, God bringing the people out of Egypt. The Noah story, God reserving a remnant so that life would carry on. The Jonah story of Jonah being in the belly of a large fish for three days, but bringing salvation to the people of Nineveh. And think of God's perfect plan to bring Jesus Christ into the world so that he would be the perfect lamb to take away all the sins. And so it's by his death and his resurrection and his ascension that we can have this relationship with God. So my observation is that when we ask this question why God is not interceding, we're probably talking about something that we're going through. Why hasn't God interceded on this particular situation? But here's my disclaimer. I don't direct the will of God. I don't know why God moves in some situations and God doesn't move in others. I mean, to really talk about it, we would have to look at each one of those situations that you're talking about. But allow me to partly answer the question with the question. If we are the body of Christ, fully equipped to be his disciples and his followers, then what are we doing to relieve suffering in the world? Don't you hear the partnership there? That if we are partners with Christ, with God the Father, with the Trinity, what am I doing? to relieve suffering in the world? What are you doing to relieve suffering in the world? Are we doing our part to convey hope, love, grace to a hurting world? The world is in a dark place and many are losing hope. 
So the question is, what are we doing as the body of Christ? I'm not trying to minimize the question because suffering of any kind is, is real. And it can be a dangerous threat to the faith. Pain can provoke us to doubt that Jesus is better than anything that we've ever lost. Pain can suggest that God doesn't care, that God doesn't love us, that God is not in control. So whether it's failed health, the lack of money, dreams deferred, the loss of independence, or the loss of a loved one, grief can attack the greatest of hope. When we read the scriptures, God's word does declare that it is possible to face agonizing realities of life with joy because the testing of our faith can produce steadfastness. And suffering can give rise to endurance. You know the scripture that trials and tribulations come to make us strong. But once again, let me be clear that suffering doesn't always automatically produce pleasant things. In fact, increased trials can commonly make people increasingly bitter, despondent, impatient, envious, and even angry. And if we respond to life and unbelief for an extended period of time, suffering can produce bitter fruit. So I've come to you this morning with good news. The Apostle Paul comes to us this morning with a message of hope, saying to us, don't give up. Christ came to make us better, not bitter. Touch a neighbor and said, Christ came to make us better, not bitter. It's all right. I want to challenge your thinking this morning with the thought, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Verse 15 begins a new segment of Paul's letter extending down to Verse 23, but Paul points out two things that he had heard about the Ephesian believers. And as Donna has pointed out, he lived amongst these Ephesian believers for three years. He knew them. But these were the things that he had heard about them, the things that it got back to Paul. He had heard of their faith. And that's good. But beyond their faith, he had gotten good reports about their genuine concern for one another. And because of this, Paul says that he gives God praise and thanks when he's praying for them. This congregation was largely united. That's good. The Apostle Paul saw that they had love for one another. That's good. And he saw that their love could possibly strengthen each other. But he wrote this letter because they were losing hope. Is it possible to be a Christian and lose hope? Paul wanted them to understand that as the body of Christ, that we are set apart, set apart by God to live holy, to live holy lives. Let's dig a little deeper. Verses 16 through 19, he prayed 
specific prayers. Paul says, I make mention of you in my prayers. What would be the contents of Paul's prayer for these Ephesian Christians? Verse 15, he says, for one thing that he would give thanks for their faith. Verse 17, he would also petition God to give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, he would pray that they might know what is the hope of his calling. That they would come to know the riches of his glory. And this is the inheritance for all the saints. In verse 19, he points to the exceeding greatness of the majesty and the power of God. And he says it's for all those who believe. Do you believe this morning? Paul is praying that God would reveal himself to these Ephesian Christians. And that God would make it impossible for them to know God more intimately. And this would include them coming to understand the will of God for their lives. So rhetorically, Paul's prayer does, not, uh, does more than just record the contents of his prayer, but it serves to reestablish the vision for their identity and to reassert the faith life that they were called to. So what if we were to pray for the church? What if we were to pray for the greater church? What would it look like? What would it sound like? I'm going to take a stab at it. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer? And we're going to keep going. Dear God, we pray that your name would be exalted in all of the world, and that your kingdom would surround and overwhelm the nations. Lord, help your church to become bold in our witness as we humbly ask that you would save all unbelievers. We pray for your continued signs and wonders and for strategic wisdom to do your work and to do your will. We pray for the success of all missionaries around the world. And in spite of conflict, we pray for ultimate unity and harmony amongst your churches. And that your peace would be paramount. Essentially, we pray that you would draw close to us and that each of us would come to know you better day by day. Amen. What if we prayed a prayer like this on a daily basis? So let me just ask rhetorically, when you pray, what are you praying for? Are you praying for the world? Are you praying for the nations? Are you praying for salvation for those who don't have it? When we pray as the body of Christ, what are we praying for? Verses 20 and 23. I think the question is, how can we lose hope when we ponder the majesty of God? I mean, sometimes I think it's just good for us to sit and think about how awesome 
God is. Because the moment we say he's awesome, tomorrow he's going to be even more awesome than that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But I'm reminded of Jude 24, verses 24 and 25. And it really talks about the majesty of God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time now and forever. Amen. Jude is celebrating three things. He says God can keep us from stumbling. And he presents us before the glory of God blameless. And he presents us before the glory of God with great joy. The Apostle Paul is saying to us this morning, when we think about the majesty of of God. We ought to break forth in doxology. We ought to give God praise just for that alone. Paul is saying, don't doubt for a moment the goodness of God. Don't doubt for a moment the power and the majesty of God. And he's saying this alone should bring us the hope that we need. And he alludes to the question, do we have any idea of the degree how to measure divine glory and the majesty and the power and the authority that it took to bring each and every one of us a spiritual life? Paul is saying, do you know what God did for us? Can you imagine it? Can you measure it in any kind of way? We don't have any terms to measure it, but we can go back and look at the scriptures and say, oh my, my. Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. And God says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish and over the sea and over the fowl and over the air and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every creeping thing that crepeth upon the earth. Can I ask a question? Who was us and let us make? Don't you see the Trinity right there? the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wants us to know that Jesus was there from the very beginning. When the Spirit of God hovered over the deep and it was formless, he's saying he was there. And this is what John 1, verses 1 through 5 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness could not even comprehend it. And then in verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. What I like about what the Apostle Paul is saying is he's saying when we think about these things, think of who is the actor in these events? It's God. 
Christ is the one that was being acted upon. Paul doesn't say that Jesus rose from the dead. He says God raised him from the dead. Do you hear the distinction? The resurrection, ascension was a manifestation of the power of God, the Father. And Jesus is made now to sit at the right hand of God the Father, advocating for you and I. Can the church say amen? I need all the help I can get, Ron. I don't know about you, but I need all the help I can get. I'm so glad that he's advocating for us. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, where Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. And originally this was a royal psalm celebrating the king of Israel, but it, became, it came to be known as a messianic psalm. Psalm 8 verse 6, which says, you made him ruler over all the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Again, a messianic psalm. Paul is saying, the one who hung on the cross, who rose from the dead, and who ascended to heaven, that's the one who we pray to. That's the one who's advocating for you and I. Paul is saying, what else do you need? He's got it all in his hands. When he got up, he got up with all power, not some power. The church ought to say amen. How can we lose hope when we ponder, ponder the majesty of of Christ. God's perfect plan played out right in front of us, in front of all of humanity. And Paul is saying is for this reason alone, we should never lose hope. So why is this significant? Most people understand hope as wishing for something, wishful thinking, God bless you, as in I hope that something will happen. But this is not what the Bible means when it gives us a definition of hope. Hope is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen, but hope is a confident expectation. Do we have a confident expectation in God. Purpose, hope is a firm assurance regarding things unclear, unknown. Do you have a firm assurance in God? Hope is so fundamental to the life of all believers because without it life loses its meaning. And that's where you and I come in. That's why this is so important. We can change the atmosphere in which we're in. We can bring light to some of the darkest places of the world because we embody hope. The Apostles Paul's message to this church of Ephesus, you're doing some good things, but don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. And Paul is saying, with God on your side, he will come and he will help you. You have to be perplexed. God will never put you to shame. If you hang on, you'll never be disappointed. But by contrast, he's also saying, 
those who choose not to put their trust in God, they're already living lives without hope. Faith, hope, and love are the enduring virtues of the Christian life. Love springs from hope. Hope produces the fruit of joy and peace. And I'm going to close with a poem by Elizabeth Fashion. It's entitled Hope. Ron, I want you to come and be ready to pray. You always have hope in Christ, for in him hope abounds. In him who was and who will always be, the endless hope that resounds. Once you're in Christ, his hope holds you fast, and of this you can be sure. And whatever you long for, this much is true. The hope in Christ, it's yours. He's our hope for tomorrow. He's our hope for each day. He's our hope during sorrow. He's our hope all the way. Till his kingdom comes, until Christ takes us away. Don't lose hope, church. Pass hope along. Don't lose hope. Never give up. Stay in the word. Don't lose hope. Get around believers who can support you in the faith. Develop a prayer life. Cry out to him. The Apostle Paul says, you will never be despondent. You will never be out of sorts. God is with you. He will be your help in the times of trouble. Let us pray. Awesome God, merciful Father, we thank you for our pastor whom in his obedience you entrusted to deliver your message of hope to your people. Throughout scripture you command your people don't lose hope. And while you never promised your children a life without struggle or despair or suffering, you do promise that you will never forsake us or leave us. And it is only in you where true hope can be found. May we embrace the magnitude of the words we sang this morning singing and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. No greater love, no greater love than this, and it is in this incredible, unfathomable love where is where our hope resides. Heavenly Father, when we begin to lose hope, let us look to the cross. When we begin to lose hope, let us look to the blood of Christ. When we begin to lose hope, let us look to the empty tomb. In times when we feel as though we are losing hope, may we seek the everlasting hope that lies in you so that rather than losing hope, that we might be obedient and take your eternal and everlasting message of love, peace, and hope to the world. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
I love this time in the service where we can have communion. I look so forward when we can get back to coming to the nailing rail and we can take it together. But when I think about communion, I think about not only us taking it today, but we take it with all of the saints. How beautiful is that? And we call it a sacrament in the United Methodist Church because God is present in the sacrament. He's with us. You can take the covers off. I love communion because it is a symbol of unity. We are the body of Christ. And it's that symbol for us. On the night in which he had given himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by your precious blood. By your spirit, make us to be one in ministry with you, in ministry to each other in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. It is through your Son all glory and all honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Because of COVID, the ushers will come and will take the communion out into the Nothex, and you're able to pick one up and take it with you. I just want to caution you. Um, there are two tabs to pull. When you pull one, you'll get the little wafer. When you pull the second, you'll get the juice. If you pull it so quickly, the wafer's on the top, OK? And I want to say this to you. We are talking about passing along hope. We have enough. So if you want to take one and take it to a neighbor, how wonderful is that? When you knock on your neighbor's door and say, we had communion, I was thinking about you, I wanted to know if we could have communion together. He says, I have no hands but yours. So we should be willing to share Christ with someone else. It's a great opportunity to pass along hope. Amen. So, so good to think about communion and everything that that means for us. And that really gives us hope, too, that the body and the blood of Christ, right, that's what was broken for us and shed for us, and that's what gives us hope every day. I just want to share one of the lines from the song that we're going to sing next, and it says, We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall, and he so loved the world that he sent his son to save us all. And that's the greatest hope that we have for ourselves and to offer those around us. So please stand as we sing together.
You may be seated. Thank you. Another wonderful time in the life of the service where we get to participate by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. For those who are plugged in via live stream, we don't want to take away your opportunity to give. That if you want to give to this ministry, I want you to go to providenceumc.net slash giving and follow the tabs. Perhaps you want to write a check to our church, Providence United Methodist Church, 901 uh, South Providence Road, North Chesterfield. I heard somebody say it, North Chesterfield, 23236. I want to say thank you to this congregation. This is a, a wonderful congregation, a congregation that is so faithful to giving. A pandemic couldn't knock us out. People are so faithful to coming, to giving. Some are so faithful to make sacrificial gifts, but we're so blessed for it. So I just want to give God praise and thanks for all that has come and for all that will come. How many of you know that God can sustain his church? Don't you listen to those lies out there. God can sustain God's church. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving. It's filled with joy because you are the great provider. Everything that we need, you send it our way. And you told us that all we had to do was to give back a portion that you've already given us. And you promised to multiply it so that it would feed those who stand in need of this ministry. So, Father, we give praise and thanks for your faithfulness, for touching hearts, helping us to become cheerful givers, helping us to delight in doing what we can do to further your kingdom. These things we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Has the Lord been good to you on this day? Would you please stand? I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to give you our benediction. And then I'm going to ask you to sit again so that the ushers can come. And um, first, they're going to get communion, but have us to leave uh, according to the COVID protocols. Thank you. That's my second voice over here. Susan Nash, where are you? Is she here? Susan, I want to say thank you to you. I know we, we talked about Billy Dale, but you've been out in that garden and doing what I don't like to do, so I, I appreciate it so much, <laughs> doing such a great job. There's so many people that are, uh, they work tirelessly in effort. I mean, they just put so much effort into this church, and we ought to give them praise and thanks. Kathy Patterson just had surgery, and yet she's right here today, hip surgery. And it's like nothing will keep her away from the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but what a witness for that. And so we just give God praise and thanks. I give God praise and thanks for all of you, all of you. It feels good to be back in the house of the Lord. Pray once again, as Ron said, a blessing upon you and something said that has been meaningful for you. And I don't know, but it just feels so good to serve with you and to see how God can use you. Donna, thank you again. Tyler, thank you. Praise band, awesome, awesome, awesome. Pray a blessing upon all you. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift your countenance and grant us all God's great peace. Be at peace and go in peace. You may be seated.